Hello, <laughs> welcome to Jumpstart, the last day, friends. Um, and honestly, it's um, exceeded my wildest dreams, which to be honest, were not particularly wild to begin with. But the, um, the curriculum that has come together has been uh, really fun. I know Martha and I have, and Hannah have spent a lot of time just talking about new ways of seeing familiar ideas. And I'm really grateful to everybody who's been, who's been with us. Um, today we have with us an old friend, um, Jordan, who was with us uh, on Tuesday, maybe, <laughs> to talk about assignments, is today going to be talking with us about assessments. Um, you can read Jordan's fuller bio um, on the Jumpstart webpage, but she comes to us from both uh, Muhlenberg and uh, VLAX with lots of online instructional design experience and also just lots of really innovative and creative ways uh, about supporting faculty as they do course design. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Jordan and ask if you can turn the captions on again, that would be great. Yeah, sure thing. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining on a Friday. Um, it's been a long week, I'm sure, for many of us. I don't think the days of the weeks weeks have matter anymore. <laughs> it's just you're here again is really how. It yes, goes. Uh, Robin, could you please um, enable the share screen? Thank you. Sorry about that. You're all set. All right, so let's get this up, and I will pull up captions. Okay. All right. So, uh, good, yeah, good morning. And um, today I'm going to walk through my thought process regarding assessments, success, and the pandemic and what all of those things mean together, because I think there are a million different ways that you can talk about assessments. Um, so this is just my take, um, my thought process after spending the last few months navigating this rush online um, while also having taught by choice online pre-pandemic. So kind of mixing those two together. So I wanted to start with um, something I, I saw in a course I recently took on uh, learning sciences and it's these 21 tenets of learning. Now, of course there are lots of different ideas of what learning looks like, but I particularly liked this set of what it means to learn. Um, so it highlights things like, you know, you need to be motivated and emotions are just as influential as cognition, stress, anxiety, depression, nutrition, physical activity. These all play a really big role in how we show up to learning and our ability to learn. Um, we're social as humans, so we learn from one another. Sleep, dreaming, those things help to to aid the learning process and help with memory, things like feedback. So a lot of different things that help us engage uh, and learn as humans across the spectrum, right? So from very young age, all the way up through our older years, these are really kind of common things. Now, I wanna think about these ideas of learning during a pandemic. So if we think about the challenges we face right now that our students are facing right now, they're probably struggling to find motivation for a variety of reasons. We certainly know that stress levels are high, anxiety and depression in our students and probably in ourselves is a little higher than it was before or more difficult to deal with at this time. Things like sleep and nutrition and physical activity have become so much harder. Um, attention spans, or even the ability to allow attention if you're in a home with not a lot of space and a lot of people and finding a quiet corner is impossible. So these to me were just like the most immediate obvious parts of these 21 tenets that just kind of get threatened by the situation that we're in right now. So if we start to think, well, how are our students supposed to learn and how are we supposed to assess that learning when that learning is already so heavily influenced by what's happening in the world right now. And then just to add another layer onto that, right? So many schools pushed to go online um, as a safety protocol. 
And we did so without a lot of professional development for our faculty. We did so in a very quick manner. Um, and we did so without necessarily thinking about some of these things as we engaged with digital pedagogy. And so to me, you lose even more things. So as, as we just heard this morning with Pat and a lot of you were talking about in the chat, these facial expressions, this signaling that we get from tone and again, facial expressions and just that social aspect, we're losing so much of that in these spaces because we haven't necessarily been taught how to design for this space um, so that we can keep these things in mind. So these are to me just some of the challenges because of the situation we're in that our students are facing as they try to bring their best selves to our classes and learn from us. So if we keep this in mind, and then we try to figure out again, how are we going to assess this learning when learning looks so incredibly different than it has before. And what I really liked is Sean Michael Morris recently gave a flipped keynote about assessment and he addresses this as well. Um, and he just sort of writes, you know, the difficulties of learning during the pandemic, there are unseen truths that look like unemployment, the unseen, unseen truth that looks like houselessness and hunger, the unseen truth that looks like unequal access to internet, bandwidth and hardware, or even physical space in a student's home to study, to attend classes and to take tests. So when we think about this and we're responding to the world, how do we, again, how do we come back to that question? How do we assess this? Because as he states here, we need to be clear about what the state of the world is in and how that state affects education because nobody can be in the world with the world and with others in a neutral manner. And what I really, really wanna focus on and it'll come up a lot this morning is the process and iterative iterative responding. So dropping some of these ideas of what best practices are and thinking instead, again, what are we assessing? Are we assessing a process? Are we assessing a product? Are we assessing individuals? How are we doing this? So um, with all of those learning barriers in mind, what even is assessment? So at its most basic level, its definition, it's the evaluation or estimation of the nature, quality, or ability of someone or something. Okay, that's pretty simple, but I think we all know that assessment, it can't just be boiled down to this one line definition. There are a ton of different types of assessment. Um, there are a ton of different theories about assessment, but I think the ones that come up most often and we talked a little bit about this if you were um, here for the assignment creation session as well, are formative and summative assessments. So examples of formative assessments, um, these tend to monitor learning. They generally feel a little lower stakes, a little less intensive. Um, and we see them a lot in discussions, short responses, classroom conversations, these smaller, a lot of times interim assessments as well. And then we have these summative assessments. And so these tend to be cumulative. So end of the midterm or end of the semester. And these feel a little bit higher stakes. And these are often represented by exams, term papers, or an end of year presentation. And then common forms too. So again, we talked a little bit about recall and memory on Tuesday. So these things are, again, our exams and our quizzes, things like flashcards we talked about, study guides, having students teach other students what they've learned. And in most of these, what I struggle with is that we don't necessarily see the learner. We don't see their journey to the end. We just see the product of what they've learned or haven't learned. Um, or the product of their test anxiety or the product of their, you know, lack of sleep the night before the exam for a million different reasons, or we see, you know, they haven't had actual, you know, food for 48 hours and then they took a test. Like we don't necessarily see the unique learner behind the, the, the learning. We kind of just see those those A and B letter grades. Um, 
which is not to say, I don't want to come across as saying that exams and quizzes don't have a place in learning because they absolutely do. But what I, for me, has been the most important part of transitioning to online learning right now and assessing students has been switching to assessments that allow me to get a better understanding of what students' lives are like in this moment. And so for me, those are the metacognitive assessments that really give us a chance to see who they are and how they process information. And a lot of those assessments look like reflection posts. They have more iterative process. So things like that semester long term paper that you do in a collaboration document where you can see how the paper takes shape over time. You can review version histories. You can have this feedback engagement in that space. And then also it's really about the connections. So what kind of connections are our students making with the learning community? So not just with their peers in your class, but how are they connecting what they're learning in your course to their other courses or previous courses? And how are they connecting it to their personal life? their own lived experiences. And so what I like about these kind of assessments is that we get a deep dive into the students' lives in learning. We see their growth and their unique understanding of our content because they get to show up with their lived experiences centered in their learning. Now, what this means for us as instructors too is that we have to build a classroom community that has more trust and care than an online space naturally gives in order to get these honest and meaningful connections from our students. We have to give them a space where they feel comfortable and safe to bring their full selves into their learning. And so what I will move on to from here is just um, you know, what this might look like in a space. And these are oftentimes, these metacognitive practices are oftentimes, uh, you know, categorized as authentic assessments. So we'll kind of move on to that conversation. But before I do that, I do want to acknowledge that for some of us, experimenting with assessments in our classrooms might not be an affordance that we have. So schools, every school is different. Um, states are different and then just who we are as people and the, the privileges we have in these spaces are different. So I do want to acknowledge that some of these shifts may seem like more than you can comfortably or safely make in the space. And I understand that. And, and again, I want to recognize my privilege as an instructor um, at, you know, at an online school that, that, that I've been working at for a while. Um, so I'm allowed to take some of these risks without any repercussions or concerns. Um, but again, I want to acknowledge that that is a privilege that some of us may have that others may not. And so hopefully, even if, you know, some of these bigger changes don't seem like a thing that you can make in your course, there are some practices that you can pull into your space that aren't super radical, um, but still allow students to have these moments of, um, you know, engaging with, with your content in a very personal and unique way for you to assess. Okay, so what is authentic assessment? Um, again, I think there are a few different definitions, but I like this one from Grant Wiggins, um, where he writes way back in 1998, that an assignment is authentic if it is realistic, it requires judgment and innovation, it asks students to do the subject, it replicates or simulates the contexts in which adults are tested in the workplace or in civic or personal life. I do take issue with the word adults used here as if our students are not adults, but um, assess the student's ability to efficiently and effectively use a repertoire of knowledge and skills to negotiate a complex task. And it allows appropriate opportunities to rehearse, practice, consult resources and get feedback on and refine performances and products. So here are some examples of what that looks like, right? A definition is well and dandy, but what does this look like in practice? 
So these are some um, from across different uh, fields of study. So um, I, I'm a humanities person, so I always go to the history one first. So for example, in a history class, you could engage in a role play of a particular event in history, describe what might have happened in one element of a historical event um, that had changed. Or um, for history as well, I know Robin mentioned this on Tuesday, I, I worked with a history course where authentic assessment looked like thinking about Civil War monuments in the modern day, as well as um, you know, how they commemorated the event itself and how we might change those within the political context and conversation of the time. So things that ask students to really get hands-on with the material, um, you know, have some complicated thoughts around what this looks like rather than just sort of memorizing some dates and, um, you know, made it, you know, regurgitating that information back to you, but really asking them to engage with that history and what it means in the world today too. Um, and so there are a couple other examples here from, again, across different fields, but one that I wanted to bring just because I have a personal connection to it um, is a course that I taught with Laura Taub a few years back at Muhlenberg. And so this was in the early days of domains at Muhlenberg. And we taught a course called Documentary Archives and Activism, where we worked with a small group of students to think through the ways in which we can capture campus history in terms of protests and activism and social justice, things that are a little more ephemeral, um, fleeting or performative, and so a little more difficult to archive than you know a yearbook from the year before. So things that weren't quite as tangible. And I remember embarking on this with, with Laura and thinking, okay, how are we going to assess students? Because what we want them to do is we want them to learn what it means to create an archive. What does this look like? What is metadata? We want them to get an understanding of how to do oral history work. And then we also want them to engage with these domain spaces like WordPress and Omeka, which is where they built exhibits of the work that they did based on the archive that they created. So how do we assess something so big and so different, right? Because I think we recognize we were asking a lot of the students in one semester and to assess them on just the final product alone, probably, not probably, would have definitely been unfair because they were by no means perfect. Um, and you can go check them out. Uh, you know, there are spaces where we definitely could have done better. And, and we ourselves thought, okay, in the next iteration of this course, we wanna do five different things right off the bat. So we had this conversation about, okay, how do we assess our students here? What does that look like in this space where we're asking them to do a lot of work? And then also how do we get them to trust us to try all of these things and recognize that we're going to assess them in a fair way? So they're not stressing all semester about trying to create a perfect product and therefore not absorbing all of this content that we're throwing you know, at them throughout the semester and not engaging with it as well as they could be because they're thinking, you know, what's my letter grade gonna be at the end of the day? And so what we decided is we were going to, one, collaborate completely on the syllabus with the students. So we had ideas of readings and things like that, but from day one, we said, what are you interested in? And what do you want to do in this course, what what is your hope by the end of this course that you can you can say like I came out of this course and I know how to do X Y and Z. So we built a syllabus with them in a Google document. It, it was ongoing. It was constantly changing, and then we looked at the learning goals and we said, Do these work for you? Does this make sense? Is this what you're hoping to you know to do? Do these match up with your goals? And we reshaped those a little based on their feedback. And then finally we said, okay, now how, how can we fairly assess our learning goals in this course? How can we look at this and say, we successfully completed or did not complete what we wanted to do? And 
you know, for the students, the immediate response was a blank stare of like, what do you, you mean? You give me an A or you give me a B and that's how this works. And so there was a lot of conversation around what it means to learn without a perfect product at the end. So what it means to learn and potentially fail, like get to the end of the semester and have nothing to show for it, except for everything that you've learned and practiced. And so what we boiled down to was weekly reflections. That was going to be the way that they were assessed. And the students chose to do them publicly on their blog so that they could actually review one another's work. And um, it allowed them to see what was happening in the oral histories that other students were recording. And so they were able to say like, oh, that's really interesting to the topic that I'm writing about. Um, and so it was this really interesting way that eventually by the middle of the semester, Laura and I were able to sort of back off and allow the students to provide feedback on the reviews that they were creating in these very public spaces. Um, and then as the culminating project drew near, we decided that why change what was working? Um, and so they wrote a self-reflection for the whole course um, on what they felt went really well with what they did, where they wish they had more time to think through something further or develop something further and just really give us a chance to see what they learned in this course. And so it was a really fun experiment um, with the students and, and changing up what assessment looked like. And I think that the one thing that we took from it from our students was that while it was stressful in the beginning to have so much flexibility and feel like they didn't quite know where they stood because they were used to getting a letter grade. By the end, they saw themselves through all of these blog posts that they had written, how much they had learned throughout the course, things that they'd forgotten that they'd even learned. And they went back and they're like, oh my gosh, I forgot that like, you know, we did this whole part, but like, oh, this was so integral to the way I ended up deciding to showcase this in a particular exhibit. Can so, I, yeah. I jump in with a question from the chat, which is oh, absolutely. what the course level is for this particular course and whether that matters as you're thinking about your assessment approach? Yeah, so this was open to anyone. Uh, we had first one first year, um, a couple seniors, and then primarily juniors. So we did have a little bit of a mix. Um, and I would actually say that the first year, the juniors and the seniors all had the same reaction to this change of assessment um, and feedback style and had to work to become comfortable with it. I don't think any group latched onto it better than the other. I feel like it felt new for our juniors and our seniors as well. Um, so I think that helped, but depending yeah. again on, Go ahead, Robin. Sorry. What, one last thing, which is not in the chat, but is definitely on everybody's mind. Can you talk a little bit about how that translated into the letter grade that you may have had to assign at the very end? We did have to assign a letter grade. Yes. So um, part of the role of the assessment was that there was a bit of a contract. We did a little bit of a version of contract grading where, again, when we collaborated on the syllabus, we said, as long as you provide every single one of these reviews as thoughtfully as you know you can um, and you engage with the material and you try, like you actually try to engage with these different technologies and practices, you get an A. And then, um, you know, a step down, like we wrote out what each letter grade would be. So it was like an A looks like this and a B looks like you do eight out of 10 reflection posts um, thing, or, or you don't choose, you know, or you don't engage with a particular tool or something like that. So students had a little bit of um, freedom to decide like, okay, I'm really busy and I don't need an A, a B sounds great. So I like, I'm not gonna turn in these two posts this week, or I don't feel like I can do this oral history this week. So they knew, as they were going through that as long as they were 
trying and engaging in these spaces where they they kind of stood in the class. Um, and then part of the self-reflection too was asking them to, you know, if this was a traditional course, what do you think that your grade would be? Um, and I'm sure some of you have done this with your students before. I find students are generally harder on themselves <laughs> than we are, um, which is true of all of us. We're usually our own worst critics, but I found that students would come at us with lower grades than we would have actually placed them at. So yeah, so that's a great question. We did have to give letter grades um, and we did it sort of on a contract grade basis using these reflections. All right, so yeah, so this was definitely a very different type of course than I had ever taught before, than I think even Laura had taught before. Um, and I would also say that probably anyone at Muhlenberg had, had taught before. So again, this is where I acknowledge that privilege of, I was working with Laura, who's a tenured faculty, who's done some really amazing work at Muhlenberg. And so us getting to take this kind of chance and, and change things up was because of uh, where we stood um, at, the, at the college at the time. So again, recognizing that not everybody can uh, experiment with assessment in this way. Okay. So what this all boils down to though, um, these examples and, this, and, and, and my thought process about assessment is that at the end of the day, we should really be assessing process over product, right? Because product doesn't tell us much about the student. Again, it doesn't tell us about the challenges they're facing behind the camera screen, in that black zone where we, we don't know what's happening in their homes. Um, even face-to-face, -face, product doesn't tell us what's going on when they leave our classroom. But process tells us a lot about the way that they interact with information. And it also gives us the chance to let students, you know, we talk about this with, with digital tools a lot, to fail. It allows them to fail, but also succeed when it comes to a letter grade, right? Because just because this, this idea in your head didn't come to fruition for whatever reasons, again, time, or it just didn't quite work, or you didn't have the technical capacity, it doesn't mean that the thought process behind it and the work that you did to research and develop and storyboard aren't important as well. Like that's the actual learning, right? That's what we're looking for. We wanna see that part. It's kind of okay that it didn't come to fruition because you know if you get up and tell me what you tried, and how you pivot, you know, you take a pivot when something didn't work. That's the that's the critical engagement that I think we're all looking for as instructors. That those are the moments where we can say, yes, you clearly learned a thing, even though it feels like you failed because the product isn't exactly where you want it to be for whatever reasons. So, um, so again, process over product. How do we help students to see this? Um, how do we help them see that this is how we're going to assess their learning process when for a lot of us, our students are very much engaged around the, what is my grade? What's the due date for that assignment? How much time do I have? And other kind of common questions that feel a little more administrative um, because that's the way most of their education has been, right? I mean, I think about a friend who teaches um, art in New York and part of her early teaching career was teaching the New York Regents exam, which is essentially just even after four years of being in high school, you could not get a diploma if you don't pass this test, right? So students are coming to us with a lot of ideas around what assessment looks like. And it's generally pretty standardized, um, whether they engage with an SAT or an ACT or, you know, some of these state mandated standardized tests, there's a lot to unpack there with them um, beyond our own ideas of what assessment look like because of what our institutions feel like assessment looks like or what we were trained in. So what I have here is, you know, what, do, what does this approach look like in practice? Like what are some things that we can change right now to start assessing this process rather than the product? And what I'm hoping is that these suggestions are also ways that are easy to engage with students around these ideas of 
I know you want to know what your letter grade is, but like this is where your learning is happening. Look at look at where your learning is happening. This is what I'm seeing. Help, you know, try to try to see it with me. Try to see what's happening in this course. So um, the first is tried and true reflection. There's kind of no better way to ask students to explain their learning process than giving them space to share and connect their lived experience to their learning, right? Reflections are a really great way to do that. And I think what's an important practice here is um, being flexible and aware of equity and access. So not everyone wants to reflect in public, right? Not everyone wants to put all of their most personal thoughts about their learning out there for everyone to see. So I always recommend you know, have conversations with your students about what it means to reflect in public spaces like a domain, a blog, or even a discussion board, and what it means to reflect in a more private space, and try to give your students the opportunity to choose what works for them best. Because some, for some of them, reflecting in public is just not safe. Um, and we should not, they should not have to explain to us why that is. We, you know, we should just give them that opportunity to do what they need to do to feel safe and comfortable. And the next one is revisions. I have never understood why exams and assignments are a one-shot deal. We talk so much about growth mindset um, in education, and yet we don't often practice it in our own assessments and assignments. So what if we started reimagining ways that students could revise more than just a paper? Right, so not just the classic rough draft or outline turned into assessment revision, but even a short response that they they feel they could do better on because they read your feedback and they go, I see what you're looking, you know, I see what you're saying, I see where I could push this further, and I want to add more here. I want to come back to this space and finish this thought. So what I like about revision is like, okay, yes, it may not show full mastery um, of a learning outcome or a goal but it shows a very clear progression towards that learning. It also shows that they're willing and, and trying to learn, um, which again, feels like a really important part of teaching. We want our students to want to learn. Uh, peer feedback, so I come back to that one a lot just because studies have shown that when students are being judged by their peers, they actually work a little bit harder um, or they're a little more aware of who they're turning their work over to, and so um, and and how they're being held accountable by their peers, and so I think you know, and again, considering how to do this in a safe and equitable way, uh, allowing students to show or to provide feedback to one another is a really helpful practice um, because it also shows as as students give this feedback, it shows how much they've learned about the content and how much they've mastered in the course as well because. You can't really provide effective feedback or formative feedback without having a little understanding of what's going on yourself. Okay, so the other four that I have here are ones that um, don't necessarily scale up as well as the first three. Like I think the first three you can pull into any course, any discipline, any size, but these may not scale up quite as well. And so you may have to be a little more creative in the way that you engage with them. If you're teaching a lecture, maybe one-on-one -on -one oral assessments is not going to be um, the thing for you because a, like a 100 meetings is a little overwhelming. Um, so these may have to be more creatively imagined in different spaces. But one of the things that I do at VLAX with my art history students is we have oral assessments at the end of each module for each competency that they are working through. And these, we call them discussion-based assessments, they're oral assessments, where I meet with a student um, for 15 to 30 minutes and we just have a conversation about what they've learned. And they get to come into the space with questions already prepared, that they've had a chance to review these questions so they know what we're gonna talk about. It's not like a, a huge surprise. It's not me trying to trick them or you know, show them that they didn't know something. It's very much driven by what they found interesting in the module um, and, and then just giving me a chance to 
push things a little further or engage with them in a way to see that, you know, they've, if they've met the competency that they were supposed to meet in that particular module. So I think oral assessments can be a really great space to do this because some of my students come in, we talk for 15 minutes, they hit everything on the rubric, they clearly know what they're engaging with, um, and you're like, great, move on to the next module, you're doing a great job. And other students come in and you're like, okay, I think we're missing the mark just a little bit here. And rather than just being like, so you get a B, you have a chance to ask some questions and kind of dig a little and see if they can, using their critical thinking and things like that, process through the information that you're asking and see if they can hit the mark on your rubric that way as well. So when they leave, you still know whether or not they've hit those outcomes, um, but they may have just needed a little help to get there to unlock some of the things that they, they did know and again, show their process. Um, so I really like those. I think they're a great way to work with, stu with students. The next is contract grading, which again, I recognize is not something that everyone can do. Um, and some institutions may not allow it, but it can be gr a great way of giving students control over their learning and their final grade. So I think students spend so much time concerned about GPAs and letter grades for valid reasons. I mean, if they want to go on to prof other professional schools or transfer or whatever it is they may want to do in the future, those may be the, the ways that they're being assessed by these outside institutions by these graduate schools. So like in our current system, those are important things. So I don't wanna downplay, you know, that, that students are obsessed with something that doesn't matter. It does matter for a lot of them um, for a variety of reasons. And so what's nice about contract grading is it can kind of wipe that off the table a little bit because there's a very clear path to whatever letter grade you wanna achieve in this course. And so when students know this is exactly what I have to do to get there, um, they can focus a little bit more on the learning, right? Um, and for those of you who have never heard of contract grading before, kind of like a working definition, um, is it's a form of grading which results from cooperation between an instructor and their students and entails a contracted number of assignments of specified quality that correspond to a specific letter grade. So again, it, it, it pulls in this ability for students to take ownership over their own learning um, and their own outcomes, which I like. And then the last two are just about collaboration. And I apologize if I am a broken record. I love collaboration. I came from a collaborative lab in college and grad school. So these are big ones for me and places where I feel like my learning happens at its best and strongest. And so collaborating on a syllabus um, where you bring your students in from the start, you know, what do they wanna learn? What interests them specifically? Where can they explore that more within the curriculum? And so even if you have learning outcomes that you've already had to list, whether your institution or department requires it, you can still have students interpret what those outcomes mean to them or add their own. And again, this isn't to say you have to start from scratch, because honestly, I, I don't know that I would start from scratch. I think even having a basic idea for students to look at and then within your structure, within what you've created, start to play around with that information um, is the best way for me, at least, to collaborate on a syllabus with students. Um, but I think it's a great way of, again, giving them ownership in what they're going to do for a semester. And then finally, collaborating on things like rubrics. And I know that some instructors are always like, absolutely not. I worked really hard on these rubrics for 15 years. Like I like my rubrics, I'm not changing them. It's hard to create a good rubric, I get that. Um, so again, just a suggestion. Um, I like holistic rubrics versus analytic rubrics. Um, and we'll look at an example of that in a minute. Um, but at the very least, I think, even if you're not gonna build rubrics with your students, I think you have to explain the rubric clearly to students. You have to take the time to be like, let's look at a rubric and break it down. What does this thing mean? How is it assessing you? Um, because I don't necessarily think that students have that skill. I think we assume that they do, 
um, or we assume our rubrics may be clearer than we think, but every student's coming in with their own idea, again, of assessment and also their own background information and learning. So they may read your rubric one way and another student may read it entirely different. So I think it's good to just clarify, okay, here's how we're going to be assessed throughout this whole class or this whole semester. Um, let's take a look at this together and talk about it so that you know what to expect and nothing comes as a surprise. Okay, so all of this is to say, um, <laughs> You know, we just want to give students a chance to evaluate their own learning alongside their peers and alongside us. And I really like what Jesse Stommel writes here um, in a presentation he gave called If Bell Hooks Made an LMS, Grades, Radical Openness, and Domain of One's Own, where he says, Bell Hooks advocates for continual self-evaluation, both of a student by the student and of a teacher by the teacher. I would add that we should together evaluate our collective work, the class itself, in dialogue. We all rise and fall together. So it comes back to this, again, this process and this constant iteration, um, this constant evaluation of not just your students, but of your work, your instruction, your assignments, um, and where students are most comfortable or most interested in your class. So they should also at any point in time, in my opinion, um, have the ability to give you feedback on the course as well, right? So if we're assessing them, there should be a little give and take where they have an opportunity to comment on how the course is going and ways in which it could be going better or designed better or whatever. And I don't think that those should come just at the end of a semester. And I think that's, you know, part of, if, again, if we're assessing them, there should be trust there. There should be some level of trust that says, okay, I'm judging you, but like you should also be allowed to provide me with feedback and assess what we're doing here. So, um, you know, assessing students in this moment and, and honestly, even outside of a pandemic, I would love to see this continue on beyond just a pandemic, uh, just means trusting them. It means trusting their voices, trusting their experiences, because they trust ours or they wouldn't be here in our courses, right? They're coming in and just kind of having faith that we're going to teach them a thing and they're gonna learn a thing. So we should really make that a two-way street. And we have to allow their unique needs and contributions to our course take center stage in our assessment of what they're doing in our course. All right, so it didn't seem completely fair to talk about assessment without giving a quick shout out to rubrics and feedback because those are such an important part of assessing students, again, in my opinion. Um, so rubrics, I feel are a very personal thing. Again, I know some instructors have rubrics they love and some instructors hate rubrics. But my suggestion is maybe take a look at trying holistic approaches if you really don't like analytic rubrics. So analytic rubrics are, um, I don't have an example here, but your more traditional rubrics, right? So you've got your criteria and then you've got maybe like a four looks like this, a three looks like this, a two and a one. Um, whereas a holistic approach reminds me a little bit more of that contract grading where you just kind of have the standards of like, this is what the best looks like. This is what the next, you know, best looks like. And then, you know, this is where you've missed the mark completely. But students kind of have choice here, again, to be like, well, I don't have a lot of time. So I think I'm gonna be a good researcher this week just because I have to work 40 hours. And then, you know, I've been tutoring my siblings on the side. I just don't have time to be an excellent researcher. I'm gonna be a good researcher this week. So I think it just kind of helps, again, give a little more ownership over their own assessment and they know where they're being assessed and they know what standards they're meeting um, for themselves as well. And then feedback. I um, was really excited, Michelle Ferkansky uh, Brock, she posted a revision of, of a work that she's done um, in which she talks about being, you know, kind of how we humanize the online. Um, and one of the steps that she focuses on is feedback. And in this case, feedback, I think, just needs to be as formative and empathetic as possible. 
And I like what she did by breaking it down. You know, she says feedback should kind of look like, you know, a reminder of high standards for your course. Like, yeah, this was a tough assignment or you've worked really hard on this process. Um, a personal assurance. So that's kind of where that care and empathy comes in. Like, you know, you've really improved, right? I see so much growth here. You've definitely got this. Um, and then finally, the specific actionable steps, right? The formative feedback part, the part where rather than just saying like, well, you missed the mark kid, try again next time, um, where you say to them like, you know, this was really great, but I think you should really spend more time researching this, or I think you could push a little deeper here or whatever this looks like in your course. Um, but, but giving them actionable steps to take. And again, this is so helpful if you open your course up to revisions, right? Because now students know where they missed the mark and they know how they can create, um, you know, a, a even better version of what they're doing um, to, to just get the, their work to that next level um, in terms of assessment and things like that. And so finally, if none of these things felt comfortable to you, again, or you feel like you know maybe your institution would not be open to some of these ideas or or, or whatever it is. Um, I've linked here the Oscar rubric, which is um, something we use frequently with our faculty just to gauge. It's kind of like a quality metric system, but it's open, um, and we suggest using it more as guidelines than like law. Um, and there is a specific session on assessment and feedback. And the reason I recommend it is because it is a really great guideline. So if you want to keep what you do for assessments currently, um, because you think that they work really well and it's worked well with your students and you've had good feedback from the students on your assessments, then this is just a great marker to check um, that you're maintaining access, you know, accessibility um, practices, UDL practices, and equity in your courses. So Again, if you're like, I really like my assessments, um, this might just be a great time to check them against these standards and see that you know, they're, you're doing everything you can for your students in an online space. So I think it provides a good alternative to um, some of the things we've talked about today. And that is everything I have. So thank you so much for, for hanging out today. <laughs> You are literally like exactly on the minute, Jordan. So <laughs> not surprised by that. Um, the chat was just going a mile a minute. So many helpful things to think about. Um, I'm going to start by asking you one question and then I'll toss it to my colleagues. So please, everybody be thinking about your questions and you can use your raise hand um, thing if you want to for us to find you. Uh, but I will start with this question, which I'm sure will not fully surprise you. Um, for people who work in highly accredited programs, particularly in either STEM or health fields, uh, where sometimes the content is uh, a little bit more objective, um, how do you think, I mean, I, I'm sure you'll say, yes, there, there can be a time and a place for all different kinds of assessments, including really regimented old school you know, multiple choice content mm -hmm. exams. But if you are in a field like that, do you think there is still room to be doing some of this work? Um, and what do you say to faculty who are saying like, that's all well and good for your history course, right. um, but it's really challenging in my field where as soon as they graduate, they need to actually go take a big multiple choice exam to get their license to do whatever. Yeah. So what do you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that even in, in humanities, my APR history kids still have to memorize um, artworks, which is silly to me. Really, Jordan? <laughs> I know, it's, it's my, wild. My kid is in Jordan's AP art history course right now. So that's yeah. true. Yes. Um, and so I think, I think that's a bigger conversation that, that Dave brought up actually about like where education is and where it could be considering the abundance of knowledge, but because of accreditation and things like that, I would still say that reflection is still going to be incredibly important, right? I mean, I have friends who are engineers and 
they have to know their equations and they have to, you know, they have to memorize a lot of things, but they also need to know how those things work. So there's still a lot of reflection about process, even in these um, spaces where we, we do have to have, have these things memorized and there are practices that are more objective. So I think that they still go hand in hand. I think that asking, you know, preparing your students in a way that allows them to pass these tests because it is incredibly important um, can also be balanced with asking them to engage with that age old question of like, okay, so show me your work. Um, but in this case, it might look like, okay, tell me your process, right? I find with, you know, again, I'm, I'm leaning on my AP or history students, but I find when they're really struggling to understand how to analyze a work of art, making them analyze a work of art with me out loud and then saying, okay, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Okay, how did you know that detail? Like, like what questions are you asking yourself as you're going through this process so that I can see maybe where you're missing some questions or like what avenue that you're not exploring um, in terms of your analytical work. And I think that works just as well with um, some of these harder sciences where these, these um, you know, exams are important. Um, I think those go hand in hand because you do, yeah, like the, the memorization of everything is great, right? But they still have to know how to use that, that knowledge. Um, so I just think there, that you can balance uh, things like reflection and revision in those spaces as well. Thank you. Um, and I'm actually going to drop the chat. I don't think Karen, um, Karen Cangelosi, if you're here, um, unmute yourself. She's been here the rest of the week. Uh, but I will put into the chat her um, article called You Can't Do That in the STEM Class, which gets a little bit at some of that. Um, anybody have a question? We've got about 10 minutes with Jordan. Um, does anybody want to ask a question or make a comment? Go ahead and unmute if you do. So I, I do. It's Amy. Sorry, my camera's, I'm really shady, but um, we You are been, shady, Amy. I know. I have such poor lighting in my house. Um, I feel like this is a reoccurring theme throughout all of our discussions, not just this week, but for semesters, is the student fatigue with some of these practices, mm -hmm. especially reflections. Um, and that's why I was kind of asking the question about course level and if we can find diversified ways to reinforce the strong practice of reflection without it becoming redundant and something that the students reject. I, I remember in the comments chat a couple of days ago, somebody had mentioned how I, I've been using blogs for like 10 years as a way for students to create their own work and now they hate them and they reject them. So I'm wondering how to deal with this fatigue even within a given semester, as you know, a lot of our classes end up being online in a given semester or throughout the eight semesters that students are engaging with us? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. Um, I, so I think for, for, for me as an, as an individual, right, with, with not a lot of say in, in how the department works where I am, um, it, I end up doing a lot of work. I end up doing a lot of bending over backwards or contorting myself around the curriculum, right? To find ways for students to find their own unique way into a course. And I think, again, that's why I tend to, to be a strong supporter of collaborative rubrics and um, syllabus and things like that. Because if you can ask your court, you know, your students at the beginning, okay, these are things that I was considering for this course um, and half your students come back and say, I really hate blogs. I've done them for six semesters now. Please, please no. Please, is there anything else I can do here? Um, then maybe that's where we can kind of step into our own, you know, change our plans and say like, okay, so blogs are off the table. Like what is another way that we can include reflection into this space that isn't you writing in a blog? Like, what does that look like? Does that look like, uh, you know, short videos, re like recorded videos? Does that look like engaging in a space like Hypothesis or VoiceThread instead where we can collaborate together and reflect around specific documents or media? Um, but 
yeah, I, I think that's such a great question because so few of us have any like strong say, like to be like, okay, if we were to reimagine our curriculum for our majors and things like that, or even our general education requirements, that would be great if we could just get everybody on board to like <laughs> use different tools and, and rely on different assessment methods so that they build upon one another all the way up through senior year. But um, I'm not sure that that's gonna happen anytime soon. So I feel like it comes down to the us um, as instructors finding ways for our students to enter our classes again in a way that feels comfortable and and unique and not or novel for them. So I, I, I really think asking your students right off the bat kind of like this is what we're this is what our syllabus says, but how does that feel? Does that is this what you were expecting? Is this what you want to get from the course or does this feel like you know, okay, I'm doing another semester of blog reflection. Like I, I can write those in my sleep and, and they're not really true reflections anymore. Like it's kind of being phoned in. So I, I think that would be my suggestion, I guess, or that would be where I find myself trying to make space for students to do what works best for them. But again, I also recognize that as an instructor, it means you're contorting yourself around your your syllabus and your course content and what your institution requires, um, which can be incredibly exhausting for you as well, right? Fatigue as instructors is also a real thing. So there is a balance um, that is kind of a personal balance. I wish I had a better universal answer for that. That was a great answer, thanks. Yeah. I'm also thinking about, I can't remember, it might've even been Jason and Melissa's thing, the tech thing, which I think a, little, a few, fewer folks came to, but I, I kind of found it helpful. Maybe it's because I'm so generally anti learning management system, but there was a real sense to that piece about the simplicity of the design of how students enter into the content. And I'm wondering in terms of the rule of twos and the sort of general fatigue and cognitive overload with navigation. Yeah how much of the fatigue around reflections is not so much around the work, it's around all the juggling that they're doing of all the stuff and how that's um, because they can't get any of it done kind of mindlessly in class the way they used to. And I don't mean mindlessly, but they used to be able to show up for class and know that like, okay, I'll get there and Jordan will take care of me. Like, I'll just do what she says. Now you have to get all those individual pieces online a lot of the times, and that just becomes a cognitive overload of access. So I'm wondering how much we could fix the fatigue they seem to feel with blogging or reflecting or discussion posts or whatever by just simplifying those portals way, way down. Because I remember mm -hmm. Mike said, look, you, all y'all people chunking up your videos into three minute segments, and now they have to watch 40 videos. And just what that looks like to them online is overloading. So I think going forward, I, I'm really maybe going to advise people to take a look, like particularly visually, at those portals and see if you can always pull back so that they enter with just one thing. Like if you're redesigning a, the course together, it's just so many elements. So maybe you have to find a way through design to make that look like one thing that's happening as opposed to the 11 things that are actually happening behind the one. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, again, I'm just thinking of even how it looks in the LMS say, or on your syllabus as a way of accessing. I'm really taking away from this week that that kind of simplicity, because I think we wanna, um, pull apart simplicity and design from simplicity and content, right? We all want our content to remain very nuanced and complex and challenging. And then on the flip side, we want the design, I think, of the learning environment, particularly during COVID, to really simplify. So that's kind of a message I'm taking away from this week in general is how to simplify those design environments. Um, we have a, maybe time for one other question or comment for Jordan, anybody have one? This is Liz. Um, just hearing you talk a while back, uh, not a while back, like a couple minutes ago about sort of trying to describe, we were talking about the fatigue uh, and this kind of self-assessment and I just, the language you're using, I think can also describe 
faculty fatigue around sort of sustaining that, like, like why it's, why it's easy, quote unquote, easier to just give a grade, right? Like that it's, it's more passive, it's less interactive. Um, it's uh, more streamlined, it's more generic, like all this stuff. And so I think of some, I just, you, from the language you're using, I was thinking like, yeah, it's some of the things, not all the same things, but some of the things that you described, the difficulties for students at managing all of it just struck me as like, yeah, I bet that those are some of the difficulties for faculty. Those are some of the disincentives for mm -hmm. um, authentic, like authentic is, uh, can be very time consuming. Like if, if I'm asking a student to self-reflect and I don't respond with the same, with a similar level of authenticity and engagement, I feel like it's broken. Like it needs, and it needs to be sustained. If I'm going to ask a student at the end of the semester, like to be like, okay, now you, you've done all this reflection. I've reflected back to you. We've been in conversation. Now, um, you know, you give yourself a grade because you have to, <laughs> because I have to. And so I'm going to make you do it, but you're ready. Like, what do you, you know, so, and, and we can have a conversation about it. That's what I did for final exams was a uh, conversation with each, with each of the students in my composition class, because they had done their portfolios, those of them who had. Um, and it, which included a bit about as a final self assessment and reflection on their learning. And I said, okay, so what grade should we put in the book? And I built in a conversation with everyone because I'm like, I'm not going to put a grade in the book without talking to you, especially if it's different <laughs> than yeah. what you in either direction. Um, so I just, I wanted to highlight that so that <laughs> the the challenges, some of the challenges I think are shared among faculty and students because there's ways that we're used to doing things. Yeah, Liz, I think I'm so glad you brought that up because I that's it's so true. And and there is such a balance to we're tired too. And and we all I think we try to hide that a little bit more or we'll only tell each other because you know we know our students are tired, we want to take care of them. So we we tend to just ignore our fatigue a little bit more. Um, but I love what Martha put in the chat and I 100 percent agree. Like the thing that worked for our course with self-reflection is that was all that it, that, that was it. Like it replaced everything. They didn't, um, you know, yes, they were engaged with these technical tools and they were like trying to make things, but there were no other assignments. There were no quizzes. There were no essays. It was self-reflection across the board. So I think, you know, sometimes you do have to, it's, it's a matter of replacing things. If you're introducing things, especially online, um, you're probably replacing something else. And then I will say too, one other thing that worked well for me and, and it might, you know, it, it might not scale up well, um, but I find that the more flexible we are with our students around these authentic engagements. So again, allowing them to come at it from what makes them comfortable, whether that's writing a response, recording a response, using another tool that they're comfortable with, um, but also being like, hey, I know you have a life and if you worked 40 hours this week and you want to write your reflection a day after it was due or revise it because you wrote one line that said, I worked 40 hours this week, I will do this when I have a minute and then you revise that later, um, is they afforded me or they tend to afford me some of those same courtesies, right? So um, on a week where I'm like, I know I'm not authentically showing up to engage and give proper feedback right now. I will sometimes write my students an email and say, I know that like I agreed to give 48 hour feedback. Like that's my contract with you all, but I need more time this week. And I have found that students have been completely receptive to that. So I think, you know, and it sounds like from the way that you Liz have created your courses, you built a lot of that trust and care with your students because you're having these conversations with them. So I agree. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> and there is a balance, but I, I think we can also model for our students asking for that time and space in terms of feedback as well. Um, it's a great way of showing them how they can ask for time and space in our courses too, I think, without feeling guilty about it or feeling like they're doing something wrong just because they're alive. 
So you knew this time was coming, friends. It's the time where I insist on staying on our schedule so as to preserve um, everybody's time that is so precious. So I'm going to ask you all to use a reaction to thank Jordan for being here. Um, you will see that you only have positive reactions to choose from, which I think is a uh, probably a good idea on Zoom's part. Um, anyway, Jordan, thank you so much for all you've offered. And I'm just reminding everybody that this recording along with an infographic that Jordan made and her slide deck will all be up um, later today on the Jumpstart website along with all the other stuff. So thank you for being here, Jordan. Thank um, you.